everyone. Today I have the pleasure of meeting and interviewing Elizabeth Norton, who is the author of so many books I can't even begin to list them. But the one we're going to talk about today is called The Hidden Lives of the Tudor Women, and she has the copy of it. I was listening on Audible. So, um, hi Elizabeth, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah, show here is the book. Yeah, there we go. Oh, it's such a beautiful cover. Absolutely oh, beautiful. I love this book, but I love this period of history, of English history. So this was right up my alley. But I have to say, like, as a normal person who doesn't have a degree in this stuff, I get so confused. And I read a lot of books, and I watch a lot of movies and documentaries, and, and yet they still... I, you know what, though? Your book made me understand it probably better than anything that I have read so far. The way that you do I'm this. really pleased to hear that. That's brilliant news. <laughs> yeah, and you know, because for someone like you who knows it inside and out, like for us, it's just like all these like Henrys and Elizabeths, <laughs> Marys, and, you know, and they all start to like, you're like, what number? How do you differentiate them? You know, it gets really confusing. But what I loved about this book is that it wasn't necessarily chronological of each life, but in all their lives, kind of, and how it intertwined and, and what kind of life they led. And that was just fascinating to me because I never really thought about it before. So what made you come up with, you know, you've written, like I said, too many books, of 14, I think? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's 13, off the top of my head, maybe 14. Okay, <laughs> right, you've written so many books on them, so, you know, and you've done the biographies of, some, you know, most of the queens and... So what made you come up with the concept of kind of putting them all together as a unit and describing their lives? It's really that um, there are other books on Tudor women, mm -hmm. um, but they tend to just focus on royalty. So it's on Henry VIII's wives and things. And that's not, that's not the whole story. And I wanted to tell the whole story, really. So I wanted very much to look at the life of a sort of um, made-up Tudor person, as you, would, as you will, but starting with the poorest and the highest in the land and just looking at women in general. So that was really why I did it. Yeah, and you know, I have to tell you that I watched, and I know this is probably a stupid question for you, but I, I watched The Tudors a while ago when that was a TV show that, that yeah. came out with Jonathan Rhys Meyer, right? Well, this mm. weekend I, re I started to re-watch it because I was looking at it with whole new eyes as to watching some of the women and what was really going on and I thought they did a really good job with it. I thought they stuck really close. I, I don't know, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, The Tudors is, is great entertainment. Um, <laughs> historically, it's not always quite accurate on the big events, but they did a good job, um, particularly with the women. Um, life was tough for Tudor women. Um, you know, it was it was doubly hard for women because not only are they they're living in the past, some antibiotics, um, Life is quite nasty, brutish, and short in many ways, but they're also second class citizens. Um, married women are entirely subject to their husband. Their husband can pretty much do what he likes to them. You're allowed to beat your wife in Tudor period. Um, Tudor husbands own all of their wives' property. So it, it, was, it was tough being a woman, and I think the Tudors chose that pretty well. Yeah, I, I thought so. I mean, and it did, first of all, I mean, how can you not love him as Henry VIII? I mean, he's. <laughs> How can you not love him in anything? <laughs> in anything? That's right. He's actually on Vikings now, which I'm really excited about. But anyway, so I digress. So I love how you divided it up. Like I said, I listened to this book, and the woman who did it, I, I wanted to look up her name. I don't know if it's on here. But she was amazing, okay? Mm -hmm. She was really easy to listen to. and Because a lot of these books, it's really difficult if you're driving and you're trying to listen and you kind of lose track where you are. But I didn't. I really enjoyed her a lot. And, of course, she had the English accent and it was all, yes. like, you know. <laughs> so it all sounded so very formal. But the way you divided the, the chapters in this book, you went in different state or different ages of their lives. That's right. And so... Go ahead. So I did the seven wives, so the seven ages of man, but the seven ages of woman. <laughs> so I basically adapted Shakespeare's seven ages, and it, it was a medieval idea and a Tudor idea as well. So other people have seven ages of man, but they're always the seven ages of man. So 
some of them match. So obviously you start with infancy and you end in old age. But with women, it's it's slightly different. Women weren't soldiers. They weren't magistrates. Um, so I adapted it for women. Yeah, I, and I loved how my, my very favorite, when it started off with um, birth, okay, learning the practices, of, you know, from what we know now, I love that chapter so much. I learned so much about how they um, not only gave birth, but what they did for during pregnancies. You know, it was such a different take on how we, especially now, what we do. And, you know, it kind of made me think about how, well, first of all, like the, the confinement, especially the queen, I guess, is like she had, goes into this confinement. I never knew that. And I thought that was really cool that she gets put in this room and, and she's like waiting around. And, you know, I've given, I have six children. So I'm thinking about being in a room waiting for a birth. <laughs> Must have been dull, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been very dull. But, okay, the one question I had is that, and I wanted to look this up so I know what I was talking about, but I, I didn't. And so when we're starting with the very first Tudor, okay, who was the very first Tudor? So, I mean, the very first Tudor, the very first Tudor king was Henry VII. Okay, um, so he, what, what, I know this, I'm American, okay, how did that, because I'm always confused as to, you know, they have to pass it on and they, so he's Henry VII, okay, yeah. and yet he's the first Tudor. How did that work? So um, England had a long line of kings, right from William the Conqueror right. um, going forward. In the 15th, well, in 1399, it all starts to get a bit messed up. Um, <laughs> Richard II was not a great king, and his cousin, Henry, Henry, decided that he could do a better job. So Henry deposed Richard and became Henry IV. Henry was the first monarch of the House of Lancaster. Okay. Um, he then, his son reigned, and then his grandson but his grandson, Henry VI, um, had some mental health problems, um, was generally, generally just not a great king. And their cousins, the House of York, so Richard, Duke of York, decided that actually he felt he could do a better job. So <laughs> Richard's son, Edward, Edward, deposed Henry VI and became the first Yorkist king, Edward IV. Henry VI then came back for a bit, then Edward IV, then the prince in the tower and Richard III. And because Richard III was so unpopular, um, largely because of the disappearance of the, ch the princes. A lot of Yorkist supporters looked around for another Lancastrian heir. Um, the Lancastrians were already following Henry Tudor, who was a distant cousin of Henry IV. And he became the Lancastrian heir, and that's really how he came to the throne. He, he won the Battle of Bosworth Field against Richard. But he, he was very obscure. Um, he really only came to the throne because all the other heirs had been killed during the Wars of the Roses, to be honest. Yeah, and that's what's great. You know, I had this, like, romantic thing about royalty. I I'm half English, okay? So I always felt like this connection. And I always thought, oh, my God, I have, you know, like, royal blood. You know, we have a coat of arms. And, you know, but when you start to really go back and back, sometimes it didn't seem like, you know, like the most fun thing. I mean, people are trying to poison you. They're trying to overturn you. They're trying to, you know control you the people were trying to control the monarchs it doesn't seem like the best life ever i'm, I'm imagining like it's so perfect because you're queen and but it really really wasn't like that <laughs> you know yeah um particularly being a 15th century monarch right right um that wasn't good um between 1399 and 1485 Three kings of England were murdered. Uh, one died in battle. One died in distant, died in dysentery while out on campaign. It was, I think only, I think only two 15th century monarchs died in their beds, effectively. <laughs> so it was dangerous. Yeah, and even Henry's daughters, um, you know, they didn't have it so fun either. I mean, they're fighting over who's, you know, they don't get along. It's a, it's a lot of division in it, you know. So it's like it's taken away my whole even. Even Victoria, you know, like I started watching Victoria and, and then there's The Crown and, you know, we're getting all these great shows that are, I love them. I mean, I love going back and watching the, the history of it, but they aren't having the, as much fun as I envisioned them having, you know? Yeah, I think it varied. I think some kings had a fabulous time. Um, Henry VIII loved being king. Um, his grandfather, Edward IV, loved being king. I think it depended on character and personality, but I think particularly 
with the Wars of the Roses, and then Henry VIII, the problems of his, in having an heir with his own children and sort of vying for the throne. I think it was it was dangerous. Um, having royal blood in Tudor times was was deeply worrying. Yeah, and so you've written, you know, I looked up um, your background, and, and you're an archaeologist, which I found that fascinating. Like, so that kind of got you into, is that what kind of led you to the interest of doing all this history? Of, and, and you love the medieval history too, not just, you know, in this era, but you, you like to go all the way back. And, and I was like, wow, does the archaeology like kind of go in with what this is? Does it tie into it? It does to a certain extent. So I, I originally studied archaeology and I studied historical periods, so medieval and early modern. And that was kind of, there's always a lot of crossover, but what I like to do is I like to work with material culture when I'm doing historical research. So I like to look at not just the written documents, but also the tombs and um, surviving objects, which is what was so great with Tudor women, actually. I could sort of bring out some of the artifacts that people actually would have used. You know, there's there's pots, there's clothes, but it, they do, they tie in really well. And it's, it's nice to tie the archaeology in with the documentary sources because so often they're, they're treated a bit separately. Yeah. What did you find the, the most fascinating about writing this book? Because I'm sure that every book you're writing, you're learning more and more, you know, history and, and more insight into their lives. So is there anything that you came across that you were like, you've written all these other books about the, about, you know, the, the queens and, and other people, like when you got to this book, was there anything that in your research you were like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that, or that's just fascinating? There was it's so much as I learned from doing this book. And, you know, I, I kind of felt I had a pretty good idea about what it was like to be a Tudor woman, but I mean, there was just so much. Um, you know, I, I was in the archives of St. Bartholomew's Hospital, for example, which is a hospital in London and, and one that's been going since the Tudor times. And um, there was all this. There were all these records about their first, their first matron, Sister Fisher, and I was reading about her life and what she did in the hospital. Um, she seems to have been quite a formidable character, and it was. I mean, it's just fascinating. There are so many stories, and they're just waiting to be discovered in archives. Whereas most most books, most researchers just sort of touch the surface. It was filled with interest. I, I was particularly interested in the section on old age because, again. You tend to kind of gloss o over the old, old age, but actually it was absolutely fascinating seeing what the attitudes to women were like when they, they were reached old age. It was just horrifying. Yeah, it really was. I mean, that, I love that chapter too. And when you were talking about the hospitals, I, it brought to mind, I was like, when I was listening to it, I thought, I didn't even think that there were hospitals. Like, mm. with the word hospital, was it the word hospital was used then? It was. Um, they're not quite the same as modern hospitals. So they're they're a bit like they're sort of charitable institutions so they do care for the sick um they would have a staff of surgeons and doctors but they were also some a bit like residential homes so they would care for orphans and particularly old people as well um it was quite desirable to get into a hospital in fact st bartholomew's had a problem that on visiting visitors days people would sneak their aged relatives in and then leave them and so they would when visiting time had finished, they would discover all these people that weren't actually patients in their <laughs> hospital and they'd have to try and track them down. So. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, that I found that interesting. I mean, I learned a lot from your book, but there were certain sections, like I said, the birth practices and, you know, women. Okay, contraception. It, back yes. Then. That was fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating because they don't really, in, in the shows that I've watched and the documentaries I've watched, they never really went into it. And um, when I was watching some of them, I, and, and these women, these mistresses are ending up pregnant. And, mm. you know, it seemed like they were so helpless in the fact of that they couldn't, what were they going to do? And then, of course, the guy gets to just, you know, the queen, the king or, you know, whoever it is just gets to leave them. And yeah. here they are pregnant and having to decide, well, first of all, it puts them, this is at a period when people are getting beheaded for stuff like this or being hung. Yeah. You know, so here they are pregnant having to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to have this illegitimate child or am I going to, you know, am I going to get caught? And then I'm going to, but I guess I didn't hang them if they were pregnant though. Are they right? Like if they said they were pregnant, they couldn't get hung yeah. until they had the baby. It delayed the execution. <laughs> if you were pregnant, it delayed it. Um, they would still execute you once you had the baby, but it gave you time to apply for a pardon. And so... 
almost every woman who was um, convicted of an offence would plead the belly, so they would say they were pregnant, even quite elderly ladies. There's an account um, of a woman who was convicted of witchcraft, old Alice Samuel, and she ple she pleaded the belly, and everyone started laughing in court, and she also started laughing because I mean, she was 80. There was no way that <laughs> she was, in fact, pregnant, but you might as well give it a go, I suppose. Right, you might as well try. I, yeah. guess I didn't realise how many women were executed. I mean, of course, you know, we know about Anne Boleyn and how that worked out for her, but I didn't realize like in the town, you know, like that there were these, that the laws were that strict. And I'm guessing it was for men too, even yeah. though the book was focused on the women. I mean, they were, it was like a no tolerance. Like if you broke a law, basically beheading, like hung, like, I don't know. It was, I found that really crazy because I had no yeah. idea. No, I mean, you would be hanged for pretty much any offence. Um, very, very low-level theft, you would potentially get a prison sentence, but anything more than that, and you were you were hanged, basically, which is... Or, or actually, in the case of some crimes, there were more specific punishments. Um, poisoners would be boiled alive, which right. is particularly graphic. <laughs> yeah. I know, and I, and I thought, you know, did they do it as a way to try to control the people? so that they lived in a sense of fear about the rules, because it does seem like very extreme to what, you know, what we Yeah, do. I mean, I think it was felt that if you break the law, you've got what was coming to you effectively, which was death. Um, the poisoning one with boiling, boiling alive, that was very much, Henry VIII was terrified about the prospects of being poisoned, and he was the one who brought in the being boiled alive, and it was very much there to be a deterrent. Because poisoning was poisoning was frightening, and actually, more women than men were poisoners because women tended to cook the food, and it was a, a non-violent means of murdering someone. So, right. actually, more women than men were poisoners and thus faced boil, being boiled alive. But it was truly horrendous. Um, an account of one person being boiled alive. People kept fainting in the crowd and screaming. It didn't actually last forever. Um, one. I think it's late 16th century, possibly early 17th century legal historian says it was a punishment too brutal to last long or something like that. So even in even in an age where they would burn people at the stake, they would maim them, they would hang them, boiling alive was a step too far. So <laughs> there were limits. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the people actually would show up at these things. That's the they really part, like the headings and, and, you know, they would actually show up. So that, that to me seemed <laughs> It's like a spectacle. Yeah, so no, there was always a crowd. Um, always a crowd. When Anne Boleyn was executed, they had to lock the gates of the tower to make sure that people didn't come in to watch. And they, they wanted a bit more privacy, but in the main, there was a big crowd at any execution. That, that's, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so you've done the, I found this fascinating, is that you've done the biographies of four of Henry VIII's wives. Yes. Okay. And, you know, like I said, watching the Tudor women again, I mean, I've got, I, I watched it before and I've, Done, read a lot of books and everything, but um, what did, else did you find? Like, because I I find that time period fascinating too, because of what he was doing. Okay, he was basically, you know, in a time period of no, you know, there was Catholicism. There's no divorce. He was trying to figure every which way he could to get a divorce, <laughs> and when that didn't work, he he went to the extreme of you know beheading. But um, his his wives are very interesting because then he's the one who started, you know, uh, to go around uh, Catholicism and, and start the Protestant church, basically. And, you know, so what, what did you find that you love talking about each one of these women? Because they were all so different. They were. Um, Henry VIII had a, quite an eclectic taste in women. So all his wives were different to each other, which is fascinating. So um, I wrote biographies of... Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anna Cleves and Catherine Parr. So, I mean, obviously Anne Boleyn, very famous, yes. very, very political. Um, right. It was it was interesting to see her sort of emerging as a political character. Um, Jane Seymour, there's not a lot on her, to be honest. It's, it's quite difficult to get a sense of her as a person. But then, I mean, there must have been more to her. She right. went, you know, she went from nowhere to marrying the king. And, you know, right. there's, there's just hints that there was more to Jane than... We, we know and we have, so I'd love to find more on her one day. Anna Cleves is fabulous. So Anna Cleves is the <laughs> wife that Henry VIII, effectively his mail-order bride, he sent off for her and didn't like her. So um, he then spent 
the entire six months of their marriage trying to get rid of her. <laughs> yeah. So um, Anne Cleese is fabulous. Um, she's certainly the luckiest of all of Henry VIII's wives, although you know she had, in her own way, she had quite a hard life. Um, but she was she was pragmatic. She accepted the divorce and she lived the life as the king's sister afterwards. And she lived into Mary the first reign. And then Catherine Parr, the last wife who survived, is I mean she's the first woman to publish a book, a first English yes. woman to publish a book under her own name, yes. which is amazing. Yes. Um, a real Protestant heroine. She's the first Protestant queen. There's no doubt about it. Um, she survived Henry VIII and unfortunately died the year after him in childbirth after marrying a fourth husband. So it's it's a sad end, really. Yeah, and I found it fascinating that you didn't do a book on the first Catherine, his very first wife. Yeah, no, I never got round to it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> there are actually a few good biographies of Catherine have come out recently anyway. So, I, you know, I feel that at the moment, at least, it's not something I would do. Um, I don't have the Spanish for it either, so going to the Spanish archives would be tough, I think. Right. But she's fascinating, Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. A really complex character. And his longest surviving wife, the, not only the wife who lived the longest, but also his by far his longest marriage. And I, you know, I don't know if the Tudors um, represented this perfectly, historic, you know, historical-wise, but it seemed like he actually really loved her. I mean, he was in lust with Anne Boleyn. I mean, you know, there's no doubt about it, like how he came about. But, but with her, it seemed like even though he, you know, she couldn't give him an heir, like it almost looked like it pained him in a weird way. Was that was that true? I mean, did he really? Did you do you believe that he really did love her, and that if she could have produced a male heir? things may have been a little bit different for them? Yeah, I mean, I think Henry certainly believed that he was in love with Catherine when he married her. So she'd been the wife of his elder brother. Right. Um, that had been a very short marriage. Arthur, her, his brother, had died, and Catherine had then stayed in England for years afterwards. Um, so he knew her very well. She was a member, effectively, of the English royal family. Right. Um, his father didn't want him to marry her in the end. He, he had Henry renounce his betrothal. But as soon as he became king, Henry said, no, I'm marrying Catherine. So I think he did think he was in love with her. Um, he was very romantic. Um, right. There are accounts of him surprising her in disguise and dancing with her. And it, it was a real, at least it seemed like a love match. But the loss of their children, um, she was older than him. And I think they just started to grow apart. So I think by the end, he hated her. There's no, you know, he wouldn't let her see their daughter. She was kept as a virtual prisoner. But there, were, there was a moment, there were years where they were in love, I think. Yeah, I, I'd like to believe that, you know. It always seemed like he, I don't know, I'd like to believe it because he didn't have to marry her. So, you know, I'd like to think that there was something, you know, there. And I was just thinking, okay, I used to know the wives in order because in school. So it's Catherine, you, you can do it for me. Cause you know, okay, so Catherine of Aragon, Catherine Aragon. divorced. Anne Boleyn beheaded, Jane Seymour died, Anne of Cleves divorced, Catherine Howard beheaded, Catherine Parr survived. So it's divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. <laughs> right, that's how I used to know it. Like, I don't yeah. know, it was like this um, rhyme or something that we learned. But so what, okay, so I'm looking at all your books and I'm like, what, what is next? I mean, you did one on, on Bessie Blount also, mm. who is the one who produced a male heir for him, but that didn't work out. But... I mean, what, what other books are you working on right now? At the moment, I'm not. I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> I, need to, I need to come up with an idea, actually. I've been having a bit of a break. I wrote two back-to-back, -back and uh, so I've been having a bit of a break. Right. But I need, to, I need to do a proposal and get, get one off to my agent. Yeah, well, I, I was thinking for that, I think you have covered, I mean, you have done a lot with that time frame. And, mm. and I, since I love to read those books, I'm so grateful that you did because... Anything I want to know, I mean, you've got a book on it for that era. <laughs> but I was thinking, like, are you, I know that's your specialty, but medieval is also a specialty for you. Like, do you think that era can ever be really finished? There's always so much to learn about. There is. You know, unless you want to go forward and keep, you know, keep going that way. Yeah, no, I think at the moment, at least, I prefer to either medieval or Tudors. Um, 17th century is really not my thing. I need to. I need oh, right. to do a lot of work. Um, and there are, you know, there are other, there are great books on the period. Um, I, so I think at the moment I'm going to stick with Tudors or maybe medieval, but I do need to have a think. Okay. So another thing I was thinking. So we know now. I know who the first Tudor is and how that happens. 
and I think I know how what happens with the last tutor until it becomes stewards, but I'd like you to tell everybody that story. So um, Henry VIII, with six marriages, um, failed to produce a surviving male heir. His son, Edward VI, died at the age of 15. Um, so Edward attempted to make Lady Jane Grey his cousin his heir, but actually his half-sister Mary succeeded. Um, that's Bloody Mary, who right. um, had to think about burning Protestants. Yes. Um, Mary only lasted five years, and so her heir was her half-sister Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Right. And Elizabeth had seen what had happened to her mother, who was beheaded, and several stepmothers, and the unhappy marriage of her half-sister, and she decided that there was going to be just one master in England, and that was her. So she never married, never had an heir, and it was always very uncertain who would be the heir to the throne. But eventually, because she lived so long, eventually, really, there was only one claimant, and that was James of Scotland, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. So in 1603, when Elizabeth died, James VI of Scotland came south and became James I of England and united the crowns of England and Scotland. Yeah, and I, you know, it's somehow I remembered, when, you know, like I kind of knew that, but reading it in your book, like it really gave me the big picture. Like I really understood how that all happened and, and how we, and you know, and, and then I'm not good until we hit Victoria again. Yeah. <laughs> I have a big Well, I mean, in the 17th knowledge. century, in the 17th century, there was a civil war. They chopped the king's head off. Right, so. right. <laughs> so it's a little bit, for me too, it's also a little bit of a gap. But you are so cute. Thank you so much for, like, you know, clearing this all up. And, and I love, love, love the Tudors. And I'm sure a lot of people out there also do. And, and I suggest watching the miniseries, but, like, you know, reading your book and then watching it. Because you'll get way more out of it. Like I, yeah. you know, <laughs> but it's always good if people want to read the book. <laughs> it's always good. Yes, definitely read the book. But I'm just saying like that show was very entertaining. But if you don't know, there are things like you're like, why did that happen? Why did that happen? And that's why I'm so happy I watched it again after reading your book, because it really clear. I was like, oh, that's why. Oh, that's what was happening. I mean, it's nice to know the real history and it makes yeah. it much, you know, much more fun to watch. But I, I think, you know. All of your books would be that much fun, and and um, I wish you so much success with this book. And when did this book come out? In May? Uh, July, early oh, July. July. Okay. Yeah, I saw something that said May, or maybe you were somewhere that I saw in May. But yeah. um, so I wish you so much success with this. And you want to hold oh, that book up you. again for everybody? Yeah, I will do too. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> I will post all the links to her book. Look at that beautiful cover. I love, love, love that cover. And um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. This has been such fun. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's okay. been lovely. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.